Hey everybody, my name is Dwayne Burkhardt and you are watching and or listening to Season 2, Episode 6 of The Rugby Report. And folks, I'm going to try something new today. Because we have gained so many new listeners in the UK this season, we're going to start our rugby coverage this week in the UK, where URC action resumed this weekend following its spring break for the Six Nations Tournament. Although since I just mentioned that, let's really start by having a quick look at this year's final standings there. Ireland looked great and won it all this year, with France similarly very impressive in second. Scotland made my youngest happy by finishing in third, while England and Wales were a bit shocking in fourth and fifth respectively, and Italy, well, it was once again the sixth nation. But let's talk about the URC now. The weekend began in Zebra as the last rank and winless Zebra Parma hosted one of my favorite teams, the 10th ranked Cardiff Blues. It was a game that was frankly much closer than I would have hoped or anticipated. Zebra scored early and held the lead for the first quarter of the game, but Cardiff finally woke up, scored a couple of tries, and took a narrow lead into the sheds. The second half was just a back-and-forth battle that in the end was decided by two missed conversion kicks, and the full-time score was Zebra 30, Cardiff 34. But perhaps the most incredible result of the weekend came on Friday night as number one ranked Leinster took on the number two ranked Stormers in a game that could easily be a preview of this year's championship. And if this was the preview, I can't wait for the real deal because the end result was a draw. That's right, the full-time score was Leinster 22, Stormers 22. On Saturday, the 11th ranked Joburg Lions upset 9th ranked Benetton 32-28 the loss does not eliminate Benetton from playoff contention as they are now just one point away from the eighth and final playoff spot, but they are now outside looking in and will need help to make the postseason. Elsewhere, the Ospreys crushed the Dragons 37-18, and in a result that is sure to annoy my youngest daughter, now sixth-ranked Connacht beat the kilts off a of number 14 Edinburgh 41-26. Later on Saturday, the number 13 Scarlets beat the Sharks 32-20, knocking the Sharks all the way down to the 8th and final playoff spot. Glasgow beat Munster 38-26, where they remain number 4 and number 5 respectively. And in what was, in my opinion, the URC game of the week, number 3 Ulster came from behind in the second half and beat the now number 7 Pretoria Bulls in a game that I think the Bulls absolutely could have won but their discipline in the second half just came apart, and Ulster was able to capitalize on almost every mistake. Let's have a look then at the URC table with just two weeks to play. There are no changes in the top five spots, although technically, Ulster does have a chance at taking the number two spot and dropping the Stormers to third. Glasgow and Munster seem destined to meet again in a few weeks, although technically it is mathematically possible now for number six Connacht to move into the fifth spot but they have several teams nipping at their heels, and if I were them, I'd just be focused on making the playoffs. The Bulls are just one point behind Connacht in 7th, and the Sharks are only two more back in 8th. Benetton, Cardiff, and the Lions are all still mathematically alive, but are currently outside, looking in. The URC will now take another two-week break and resume the week after Easter, and we will, of course, look in on those games in a future episode. Crossing the Atlantic Pond to the country that invented fried butter. And sadly, no, I am not making that up. That is a thing in the American Midwest. We will check in now on Major League Rugby here in the USA. The weekend started with the Houston Sabercats bouncing back and beating Atlanta 40-28. Atlanta has now dropped two in a row to Western Conference foes. Next, the New England Free Jacks, who handily defeated the defending champion New York Ironworkers last week, shocked the heck out of me by having significant difficulty against the winless Dallas Jackals. The Free Jacks did win the game 10-9, but it was not an example of consistent play. Utah bounced back after getting crushed by New Orleans last week, although their convincing 41-19 win was against the struggling Toronto Arrows, so that may or may not indicate that they've righted their ship. And finally, last night, the NOLA Gold won their third straight, edging out the DC Old Glory 20-17. to 
Now, before we look at the standings, a reminder that there is, as always, one last game in the MLR this weekend, a game that is literally being played as we record this podcast. And so those results are not reflected in these tables. That game this week is in my original hometown, Sweet Home Chicago, as my Chicago Hounds try to make it two in a row as they take on the Seattle Seawolves' Good Luck Hounds. Now, let's look at the MLR standings, where we find the San Diego Legion clinging to a one-point lead at the top of the West, with the Houston Sabercats right behind them in second. The Seattle Seawolves and Warriors are safely in third and fourth, with the Chicago Hounds far behind in fifth, and Dallas is still looking for their first win in the basement. In the East, New England has now broken out and taken a commanding lead atop their table, but watch out, New England, because the NOLA Gold are apparently determined to make 2023 a worst-to-first year and have now rocketed from the bottom of the table all the way up to the number two spot. The DC Old Glory are just one point back in third, with Atlanta two more back in fourth, and the New York Ironworkers just one more back in fifth. Finally, Toronto is significantly farther back in last and clearly needing a jump start in the Canadian cold. Now, let's leave the USA, cross into the Pacific, and talk about Super Rugby! Round 5 began on Friday night in Christchurch as the Crusaders hosted the Canberra Brumbies. It was a game that I knew I was sticking my neck out on when I predicted the winner, but hey, you win some, you lose some. I knew the Crusaders were finally hitting their groove, and they were headed home, but the Brumbies hadn't lost yet, and after their performance over the last few weeks, I just thought they had a better chance. Well, no. The Brumbies were shorthanded to be sure, with seven players resting for the World Cup and or out with injuries. But still, the Crusaders just dominated every phase of this game, never trailed, and handily beat the Brumbies. Full-time score, Crusaders 35, Brumbies 17. Saturday's action began in Sydney with a frankly forgettable game between the Waratahs and the still undefeated Waikato Chiefs. In many ways, the Chiefs dominated this game. But one of those ways was not the score, as the Waratahs played off an inspired defense and somehow managed to head into the sheds for halftime tied 7-7. The second half was better for both teams, but only marginally so. And in the end, the Chiefs eked out their fifth straight win, and the Waratahs fell to 1-4. The full-time score was Waratahs 14, Chiefs 24. Next up, my Highlanders hosted the Fijian Drua in a game that I was really worried about at game time. The Highlanders, already dealing with more than their fair share of injuries this year, had to make three game day replacements due to player issues. How deep into their roster of players were they? Well, one of their replacement front rowers, who made his Super Rugby debut in this game, was playing in the U20 League last week. So, yeah the Highlanders took the field with a lot of new faces. And, well, maybe they need to do that more often. The game started out looking like a really even battle. But about halfway through the first half, the Druas seemed to completely lose their concentration on the game for several minutes, and the Highlanders took advantage quickly, racking up a couple of quick tries. But still, it was only an eight-point game at the half, and certainly a score that the fast, aggressive, and opportunistic Drua could get back into. Except... In the second half in particular, it was the Highlanders who were fast, aggressive, and opportunistic. Aaron Smith was truly back in form and had a magnificent game at scrum half. Sam Gilbert similarly had another spectacular outing. Otago standout Cam Miller, who made his first appearance in a Highlanders uni last week, scored his first Super Rugby try in the second half. And Connor Garden Batchup, despite being the victim of what the game commentators and I agreed, was one of the worst yellow card calls in years still managed to also have a great game. And in the end, well, the Highlanders ran away with it. The full-time score was Highlanders 57, Drua 24. Saturday's action concluded in Mount Smart Stadium as Moana Pacifica returned home to face the White Hot Hurricanes. These same two teams met on the same field a year ago in an historic game as Moana beat the Canes, winning their first game in franchise history. Could they do it again? No. And folks, I get that Pacifica is not a top-tier team in the league right now, but still, the Hurricanes are simply 
on fire. And they are getting better and better by leaps and bounds every week. Once again, scrum half Cam Roygaard was everywhere and looks so good that I've already started wondering how long it's going to be until we see him in an All Blacks jersey. Kenny Naholo had his second breakout game in a row, including a try assist that you have to see to believe. The Savia brothers were spectacular. Frankly, the entire team played lights out rugby from whistle to whistle, and they just pulverized Pasifika. The full time score was Pasifika nil. Hurricanes, wait for it, 59. Ouch. Sunday's action began in Melbourne as the Rebels took on the Reds in a game that I said I thought the Rebels could win, but I'd believe it when I saw it. And well, I saw it. The Reds started the game well and looked to be fully in charge for about the first quarter. But then the Rebels scored four straight tries, and suddenly they were the ones who looked to be in control. The Reds came back strong in the back half, but the hole they dug when they fell asleep was just too deep. And in the end, it was the Rebels who took the win. Full-time score, Rebels 40, Reds 34. And finally, we close out round five in Auckland with a game that sort of went exactly the way I thought it would. The Blues seemed to be in control for the bulk of this game, but I was surprised by how sloppy and disorganized they seemed. They won the game by a full-time score of 30-17, to but frankly... I thought they could and should have won it by a lot more. This game should have been 50-10, to 10, not 30-17. to 17. And in this rugby reporter's opinion, the Blues have some problems to fix if they're going to compete for the title this year. And on the other side of the field, for the second week in a row, the force were fierce in the last 10 minutes of the game. In fact, if they could play the first 70 minutes of the game the way they are playing the last 10 minutes, they'd not only have a winning record, They'd be dangerous. Checking in on my predictions now, I came into round 5, 17 and 7 on the season, and coming off my first perfect week of the year. And this week, thanks to the Rebels and Crusaders, I was 4 and 2. Not bad. Brings my season total to 21 and 9. Let's quickly look ahead to round 6 next weekend. We will start in Mount Smart, where the winless Pacifica will take on my Highlanders. Moana will be looking to play better after getting shellacked by the Canes this weekend, but the Highlanders have now won two in a row after dropping their first three, and I believe they're going to do it again. Highlanders win. Saturday's action will begin in Brisbane, where the Reds will take on the Crusaders. I have great faith in Brad Thorne as a coach, but the Reds are having some serious consistency issues so far this season, where the Crusaders are clearly finding their groove. Crusaders win. Next up, the Drua will return home to Fiji to host the Melbourne Rebels in what might actually be the most evenly matched and entertaining game of the weekend. Both teams are better than their records, and the Drua desperately need to show that they can stay focused for 80 minutes in a row. But I think the home field advantage will be enough to get them over that hump, and they will beat the Rebels. Drua win. Saturday's action concludes with the game of the week as the undefeated Chiefs host the Auckland Blues. The Blues are a great team, but as I just noted, they have some serious consistency issues of their own, and they'll need to find a way to stop things like their strings of silly handling errors in order to win this game. But in Hamilton, against a good Chiefs squad? I just don't see it. Chiefs go 6-0, and they win this game. Finally, on Sunday, the Brumbies return home to face the Waratahs. Both teams are coming off of disappointing losses, but the Brumbies will be at home in GIO Stadium, and they're still just a much better squad right now. Brumbies win. And lastly, the Western Force will finish their New Zealand road trip by driving down to Palmerston North for a special game against the White Hot Hurricanes. The Force have shown the ability to explode toward the end of the last few games, but I'm starting to think that the Hurricanes may very well be in the process of having a Cinderella season Which is to say that if they keep playing like this, they absolutely could win it all this year. And in any case, I predict that the Hurricanes will blow away the force. Canes win. And that's it, folks. That's all we have for Season 2, Episode 6 of The Rugby Report. Thank you all for watching and or listening. And until next time, 
You should know that I just finished building a model of Mount Everest. My wife asked me if it was to scale and I told her no. It's just to look at. See you next time. Bloopers. See, the trick is to have your script cued to the right spot. It's how the pros do it. Right. Crossing the Atlantic Pond to the crunch... To the crunch... To... It's a nation state. It is a country. I'm not sure what word I was going to use. But it obviously means I need tea. Next, the New England Free Jacks, who handily defeated defending champion... Let's start again. We're shocked. They weren't shocked. I was shocked. Someone was shocked. That was me being shocked. I think I need electric shock. Can we do that one more time? All right, here we go. Reminder that there is, as always, one last game in the NM in the NMLR in the NM in the NMLR in the Miniminimina tables. That said, this week my uh, <laughs> Toronto significantly farther bath in the farther bath. They need a bath. Someone needs a bath. I have great faith in Brad Thorne as a coach. And I'm going to do it one more time, not because I have that much faith, but because I screwed that up. And Connor Garden Batchup being just... That sounds stupid. Perhaps I need more tea.